So now I'm going to tell you about today's speaker, uh, Richard Cahan. Um, Rich has been at our library several times talking about photography, the photo-driven books that he has authored. Um, it's really a pleasure to have him back. I'll just tell you a little bit about his background. Um, Rich is a journalist who writes about photography, art, and history. He worked at the Chicago Sun-Times from 1983 to 1999, primarily as the paper's picture editor. He is an author and publisher of City Files Press, um, combining his love for history and photography. And one of his books um, is called Un-American, the Incarceration of Japanese Americans During World War II, which he presented here at our library several years ago and includes images of Dorothea Lang, which is how Rich and I kind of decided to work together on today's project. So that's how that came about. So now I'm gonna turn things over to Rich, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Roz, very much. Thank you for coming. This is the first time I've ever worn one of these. So, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how it works. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. What can I add to my um, biography? I live in Evanston. Uh, and I, as Russ says, I've been a journalist all my life. That's really what defines me. Um, and I've worked as a picture editor. Does anyone here know what a picture editor? My mom never knew. So I guess I should explain it to you. Uh, you all know what a copy editor is. A copy editor is somebody who works with writers and um, corrects words, phrases, figures out how stories come together and how they work in a book or in a magazine or in a newspaper. Well, a picture editor, whoops. Oh, I'm out of the frame. Okay. A picture editor works with photographers in the same way. They look at their photographs. They decide sometimes which photograph should be printed, or I guess printed is an old fashioned word, but published. Uh, they sometimes crop photographs. Uh, they work with photographers in coming up with captions and la or labels. And they try to create a product, whether it's a book or a documentary movie, um, that's based on photographs rather than words. And um, Dorothea Lang is uh, certainly one of my favorite photographers, and obviously it's she's one of your favorite photographers. Um, she and she had an ability to take a roll of film, and in those days, I don't have to explain what film is. If you guys are all old enough to understand what film is, but in the and you guys probably used to use thirty six millimeter thirty six photos on a long roll of, um, of film. Well, when Dorothea Lang was taking pictures, primarily she was using larger cameras and she was getting rolls of 12, 12 negatives. And the negatives were each two and a quarter inches, two and a quarter by two and a quarter. So they were square. We're used to, uh, in our era, using uh, 35 millimeter film, which is one inch wide by, it's uh, one and a half wide by one. So her film was quite larger than, than the negatives that we used. And, um, her work, uh, she's most known for her work for, with the Farm Security Administration. That was a government project to document America in the 1930s. And uh, Dorothea Lang took about 5,500 pictures uh, with the Farm Security Administration. And that doesn't sound like a lot now. We, 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 we shoot 1,000 pictures on our vacations, or, well, I shoot 1,000 pictures a day. But, um, but that's pretty remarkable because every time she pressed the shutter, there was a real commitment to saving what she was seeing. We'd press a shutter 20 times and then we'd go back and we'd look which, which, which one of us is smiling the best. But there was a commitment and there was a, a finite amount of photography that you could do in those days. And um, she, when you look at her contact sheets, you can see how careful she was in what she photographed and, um, and how every, every frame counted. The other thing that I think we forget about photographers from her era is that getting around the country in those days, in the 1930s, was an immense struggle. Cars were, you know, highways weren't, there weren't any, inter, there wasn't any interstate system. Highways were more rutted than they are now. Cars obviously didn't have the kind of power and speed as they have now. So the fact that she crisscrossed the country during those years and, 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 and her colleagues, her other photographers from this Farm Security Administration, is pretty remarkable. Today, we're gonna to look at her pictures from those years, but I wanted to start out by looking at the pictures really that define the book. Uh, most of you read the book. I won't ask for a show of hands. I'm not into that. But, um, so I'm gonna to try to make this talk worthwhile for people who read the book and who didn't read the book. So let's start with 
Let's see. Let's start with making this work. Uh, maybe I should turn it around. Roz, where do I point it to? I could do that. Let's see. No, that's not working either. Great. Okay, now. Okay, I'm going to try this too. There. Okay. So let's start with San Francisco. And San Francisco was something of a character in this book. Obviously, in, in formal terms, it was a setting, but I think it took on the role of kind of a, a character in the book. And uh, a lot of this is based in the uh, what was called the monkey block in, uh, in San Francisco, which was built, as you can tell, kind of after the Civil War during the mid, uh, mid 19th century, the mid 1800s. It has kind of like this gold rush kind of feel to it. It was four stories tall and it was the largest building in San Francisco when it was built. And um, it wasn't a bohemian center until after the fire, the, the, the earthquake and fire in 1906. That kind of changed San Francisco. And the, the neighborhood became the, known as the Barbary Coast. And it was kind of a neighborhood of down and out people, poor people, uh, bohemians. Um, and, and she calls the building the monkey block. Throughout the entire book, she never mentions that it's called the Montgomery Block. And I was, I was actually surprised at that. So where is the building now? You all have been to San Francisco, most of you. The Transamerica Pyramid is the site of the monkey block. So things have changed quite a bit. And in the book, uh, Giuseppe Coppa is an important character. He ran Coppa's restaurant. And it's described as a very bohemian place. Frankly, as you read about it, it was just like an Italian restaurant. I mean, it didn't seem all that, uh, I mean, well, by today's standards, I think having an Italian restaurant in San Francisco in 1918 was probably a big deal or not a big deal, but it was an unusual thing. But now we would just consider it an Italian restaurant. But that's Giuseppe Coppa. And this is pictures from the inside of Coppa's. So it does have this kind of little bohemian look to it. And everybody has um, a feeling of what bohemian means. Um, and I had to look it up in the dictionary, but can someone just shout out when they say, when I say bohemian, give me a word that, that comes up and I'll repeat it for the people watching. Unconventional, that's great. Artsy, okay. Those are the two words that, that any, anyone, anyone else have the hippies of the day. I agree, I agree. So this was kind of interesting because here are the bohemians in Copas which of course was a little surprising to me. I thought that they would be wearing their hate Ashbury beads. And uh, they, 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 they were wearing mostly suits and dresses that went down to their ankles. So it wasn't quite the bohemian life that, that I, I think of. Um, one character that wasn't large in the book, but oh, uh, I, I skipped over, let's see, hold on. No? I guess it's there. So that is, uh, that is an important character in the book. Um, that's Donaldina Cameron, the woman who ran the orphanage, who took care of Chinese uh, babies that were kind of left without homes. And she was an, a real person. She was, uh, I was trying to figure out who we would compare her to in Chicago. And the only person I could really come up with was Jane Adams in the settlement house. Uh, she did it for 50 some years. And this is her uh, getting an award late in life. And interestingly enough, this is her accidental uh, home, and it's still there, and it's still in business in, 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 in uh, San Francisco. So that was a surprise to me. Yeah, uh, there, yeah, there's the there's the Transamerica building uh, in the background, and the, the, this is the accidental building right here, where where uh, where Caroline Lee, the the character who really is just based mostly on uh, imagination was raised and grew up. Uh, she talks early in the book about Dorothea Lane being trained by Arnold Genty. And Arnold Genty was uh, a really important photographer in San Francisco um, during the early part of the 20th century. He photographed Chinatown, which was very unusual. And he has a great series of photographs of Chinatown, but he's most famous for a photo that you guys have probably always seen. This is the 1906 earthquake. Uh, he was, I think, the only photographer or one of the only photographers, but I think for every, every picture of this earthquake, 
if you go to Wikipedia, if you go anywhere, you'll see this photograph of the fire that occurred after the earthquake. And this picture here is another amazing picture that he took. And um, she was a student of, of Genty moved to New York City, and Dorothea Lang was a student of his in New York City during the early teens. And, um, and he later became a very famous photographer of Greta Garbo. And he took lots of photographs of Greta Garbo in the 1920s, and he didn't put this together. Somebody recently put this kind of montage of Greta Garbo together. And I love it because it kind of harkens back to how photographs can be used in so many ways. You know, when, when he was taken, and I'm sure he never thought about it, could be Photoshopped and put all together. But photographs are always alive and always changing. So um, the character, that, there were about three characters that she talks a lot about. And this is uh, Cancelo Kanaga. And in the book, she's the know-it-all. She's the person that, um, that Dorothea Lang is always depending on to find out what's happening in San Francisco. It talks about her being a, uh, a reporter and photographer for the San Francisco newspapers. And it's absolutely true. She was that. And she's somebody that really kind of got away from history. She moved to New York City in 1924. So the book, I think the book ends during the 1920s. And, uh, and she le left New York and photographed New York City. And then in the 1930s, she became a very prominent photographer taking pictures of African Americans in the South. And the photographs are really beautiful. There was a show put on, she died in the 1950s, and there was a show at, soon after her death of her work, and it's really beautiful. And there she is in, the in 1952, photographed by Imogene Cunningham, who was another important character of the book. And do you guys, do you guys know Imogene Cunningham? She's somebody that you might have known. I remember her, she was on The Tonight Show uh, in the 1970s, just before she died as this little elderly lady photographer, but she was also very well known for a photograph that she was in her 90s and she was photographing a nude model in uh, the Redwoods. And you might've seen that photograph. I actually didn't bring the photograph here today because I thought it might be inappropriate, but it's worth looking up. If you look up Imogene Cunningham and model, you'll find it. The model was a very famous person by the name of Twinka. But Cunningham was spectacular. This is what, what she looked like in the 1930s. She lived in Oakland, just like in the book. And she was, well, I don't have to tell you she was a great photographer by seeing this photograph. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, Edward Weston and Marguerite Mather. And uh, she was a great, in those days, they called them pictorialists, uh, using the camera for high drama. And it was very close to painting in a way. She was also very well known for her botanicals. Uh, this might remind you a little bit of George O'Keefe. They were, there were, there were a group of them, like about a dozen photographers and artists in Arizona, New Mexico, and California, and they all knew each other. And Imogene Cunningham was close friends with George O'Keefe. Uh, this is a picture she took in the 1930s of the dancer Martha Graham. So you can kind of get a sense that she definitely was bohemian in the sense that she was a very modern artist. She was looking, experimenting for new things and, um, and, and always associated with people like that. And this is my favorite picture. It was in 1957 and it's just her bed sheets and her hairpin on her bed. And sometimes when I see a picture by a photographer, I don't need to know, see anything else that they've ever produced. They're in my in list, and this is that picture to, 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 when I see that. And this is a picture that she took um, later in life uh, of, of Chinatown in San Francisco. And I'm using this, I, I thought this was interesting because it's so different than the Arnold Genty picture of Chinatown. There's, there's certainly, um, uh, uh, there's just more emotion, there's more feeling that she has instead of just documenting this person, she has a real connection to this person. And that's her picture, uh, that's her picture of Ansel Adams. Now, you guys have all heard of Ansel Adams, right? You would be surprised when I talk to college students and I bring up the name Ansel Adams, 
nobody raises their hand. So I, I don't think I have to go deep into Ansel Adams, but Ansel Adams and Dorothy Lang were very close friends from the 20s through their death. In fact, Ansel Adams printed um, Dorothea Lange's pictures of the incarceration of Japanese Americans. And Dorothea Lange said that he had absolutely no sense of how, how, how dangerous this was. And he thought everything was, was, was beautiful. And, and Ansel Adams said that Dorothea Lange only cared about kind of like the sociological look at all this. He went to a camp later in life and photographed people. And the photographs that he took, people look glorious and, and heroic. And, um, and, and he's been criticized because how can you make these people who are being in prison look so great? And somebody said of Ansel Adams, he could make a rock smile. That was just his personality. So you know this picture. This is probably one of his most famous pictures of uh, a storm coming. And this is a picture that he actually took in the 1940s when he was at the Manzanar incarceration camp. And he went out and took this photograph. And this is a picture that if you're, if you're ever five hours northwest of Los Angeles, you can go to this camp and you can actually see the spot that he took this picture. There's like a little geocode in the, in the rocks. I've been there and you can see the, but it looks so strange because you're looking at it and it's in color and you have this you know, emblazoned in your mind as being black and white. So that's the Ansel Adams that we kind of all know, uh, older with his camera out in the, in the wilderness. So, uh, oh, and, and this, I, I always have trouble with his first name, uh, Sadaichi Hartman. And he was a really important character in the book because he was the king of Bohemia that was having the parties. He was a real person, very much a real person. In fact, I read him in college. I mean, I, I was assigned him in college. I don't know if I read him, but, um, but he was a friend of Walt Whitman in the, in the 1800s. And um, he, was, he went around the country uh, being kind of bizarre and, and, and wonderful. Here, here he is in San Francisco, truly as the king of Bohemia. Um, he had a party in San Francisco called a smell party where he brought in all these perfumes and everyone came and, and imbibed in different rooms, rooms in the perfumes. Um, there's a, there's a house that's mentioned in the book, and this is the mansion. Uh, and in, in real life, he set fire to something outside the mansion and almost burned it down. So he, he would usually be very welcomed in cities for about three or four years, and then he'd be kind of exiled. So let's talk about Dorothy Lange, our favorite. So this is the, this is a studio right here, 540 Sutter Street that that's mentioned throughout the book. In real life, this was a two-story building because her studio was on the second floor and there was an art gallery on the first floor. So to be honest, I don't know what happened. I don't know if they chopped off the second floor or they, they, they redid the whole building. The building has this look that it could have been redone, you know, in the, in the 50s, 60s. You know, it's, it's very possible that this is, not, this is the, the address and not the building. I couldn't quite figure that out, but this was certainly the location. And this is Dorothea Lange in around 1920. Young Dorothea Lange. We'll see lots of pictures of her and you'll see her grow. But um, uh, I love this picture. I think it just shows kind of how you can see her eyes filled with life. Um, did she talk about, she did talk a little bit about Dorothea Lange's problems growing up. Um, her father abandoned her family when she was about um, less than, around 10. She had polio starting about five, at, at about age five. And the things that the book doesn't talk about is she was always um, uh, sickly. She was always fighting diseases. Um, she had what was called post-polio syndrome starting in the 1940s. And she ended up dying of uh, cancer in the 1960s. And she had years where she really couldn't work. But she always said that it was the polio, it was the limp. I think it's mentioned in the book that she had. She kind of had to bring her, she talked a lot about her leg in the book that made her she thought it made it easier to be accessible to people, that she would walk up. Imagine the migrant mother and Dorothy Lane gets out of the car and she's kind of bringing her leg up with her, how much easier it was for her to approach all types of people. And so she never complained about it. So let's take a look at some of the actual pictures that she took in the 1920s or 1919 starting. 
of uh, society people, because that was an important part of the book. And this picture, I don't know if you can see, was dated from 1919. And uh, this was a famous, uh, her, her name was Estralita. She was a famous dancer in or around California uh, in, in, in that era. And these are pictures of some of the, uh, I think the word society women is unfair, uh, wealthier women who hired her to take pictures of her. And um, you can see this early picture that she has. It's very much similar to the Imogene Cunningham picture. It's kind of gauzy and out of focus. Cameras at that time, I'll say they had problems with focus. And I think that photographers use that to their advantage in making what they call pictorial pictures, pictures that almost seem like they could be painted. Um, I think that's a pretty beautiful picture. Now, this is a much more traditional picture from that time, another woman um, taken around 1920. But here, I think this picture breaks with the usual society photographer. You know, I don't know if you remember in the book, she says, there's an advantage being a woman because I have access to women in a very non-confrontational -conf way. And this is a perfect example that I can't imagine in that era, any man taking this kind of picture. And uh, it really shows to me how, um, how special she was. You know, she's, she's a portrait photographer, but she's going beyond a regular picture of somebody in a studio. Here's another person. And here, this is, I'm guessing 1925, how different this picture looks from the earlier pictures. Everything is in focus, sharp focus. But again, remember in the book, she says she wanted to try to convey someone in one picture, one sixtieth of a second. And I think you can see her striving for that kind of thing. She's that her, the the woman is not looking at Dorothea Lang. She's just in a you know she's 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 conveying her personality rather than her likeness. And these pictures are from the 1930s, and I see these pictures as getting pretty documentary esque, not documentary. So what do I mean by that? She's not taking a, um, she's not taking an ethereal, um, special, you know, picture. She's trying to show what people really look like. And these are two kids, obviously. And look at all these pictures of the 1930s, much, much plainer. I love this picture. Now, would somebody want to buy that picture of their husband? I don't know. It, it almost seems like it's too real than the kind of stuff that we want on our walls. That's a pretty beautiful picture. Most of these were of the Catton family who's mentioned in the book. And these are pictures of the Cattons. Okay, now trouble begins. <laughs> um, Mater Dixon was obviously a really important character in the book. And I don't think he came off very well. He came off to me as an alcoholic who didn't really care for his daughter or didn't, didn't care, not, not, not that he didn't like her, but he didn't care for her. He was putting more responsibility and more, more headaches on Dorothea Lange, and I think that's true. Um, but you can see from this portrait, which Dorothea Lange did not take, that he was kind of a larger than life kind of Western guy. And uh, that's how he's portrayed, I think, in the book. Uh, Dorothea, uh, Dorothea Lange had a quote about him that I thought was great. I've never watched any person's life as closely up to that time as I watched his what it held, and how he lived. I, I think that's really pretty, pretty interesting. So these are the kind of paintings that he was very much well known for. Western scenes, lots of Indians, big country, giant skies. Um, this, is, this, was, uh, this was who he was as a painter. And this uh, doesn't look like a John Wayne movie. It's just all, all set. I, I, I really wonder what Native Americans would think of both of these paintings. I, I don't know, but I think it would be worth finding out. And there he is again, speaking of John Wayne, that's Mayor Dixon looking like John Wayne, kind of bigger than life on the big prairie. So you have these two very different personalities coming together. Here's another one. And remember, in those days, painters were usually portrayed as kind of French, you know, with their little... Uh, kind of uh, gown on and they with their pastels and their paintings. And here he's, he's showing himself as a very different kind of person. So they get married. 
1920. That was, uh, was that, it wasn't really a large scene in the book, but it was an important part of the scene. So I, I tracked down the two, uh, two wedding articles about their wedding in the San Francisco papers. And I was really surprised at first to see that they, that Dorothy Lang took the prominent role. Here's one picture and here's the other one. We'll go back. I thought, boy, that's really amazing because she was just really starting her career. She got into San Francisco in 1918 and this is 1920. And she's marrying Mayor Dixon, who was like a big deal artist. But then I realized, of course, she would have the pro prominent picture because she's the bride. And in those days, and I think still today, it, the wedding is the bride's day. And so it doesn't matter whether you're marrying John F. Kennedy, you're going to have, you know, your picture is going to be the bridal picture. And um, I, 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 I love that the, the thing says noted artists, and they're not really talking about Dorothea Lange. But I like this. Here is the betrothal of artists announced, and Mayor Dixon will take bride. So here's a picture from 1925 of they had two kids. They had Daniel Dixon and they had John Eagle Feather Dixon, kind of interesting middle name. And uh, this is the first baby, and here she is. And that's Quonsela Kansi watching and she has the expression that really uh, a writer really writes about constantly being up uninterested problem from the very beginning and here she is you know seeing her little you know half brother not very interested in, in the least that's Dorothea Lang on the right and that's Mayor Dixon in bed which sounds exactly like he would have done after birth bring the baby over to me when you get a chance and that's con that's a picture by Dorothea Lang of Kansi the, the character who's in a book who was was difficult. And this is a picture. So uh, Dorothea Lang got a divorce from Maynard Dixon in 1935, and she got married about two months later. So I guess there was something going on before that, I'm guessing. And, he, and she came back in the 1940s to take a picture of Maynard Dixon's studio, and she wrote, For the Boys. She wanted the boys to always know where that, that studio was. So there's Dorothea Lang. And she is, she's at the, uh, you know, she just looks like she's part of society and, and, and uh, well-dressed and, you know, uh, very much different than the pictures you're going to see in the near future. So everything changes in 1932. Uh, and they did mention that in the book. Dorothea Lang, um, it's a depression, people are out of work, the streets are filled with unemployed people, and Dorothea Lang decides to go out of her studio and take pictures of people on the street. And this is probably, uh, next to the migrant mother, this is probably her most famous picture. It's called the White Angel Breadline. It was uh, uh, a woman had set up a breadline for people, and Dorothea Lang came out of her studio and took this picture. So different from everything that she's ever done. Think about how different the subject was. Um, you know, she used to take, the, the challenge for her was to arrange things when she was taking pictures of her subject. And now she had to find things and she had to select things and she had to figure out what to photograph. And obviously, um, you know, this wasn't the kind of picture that uh, she had ever thought about taking. She wrote after that day, I can only say, I knew I was looking at something. You know, there are moments such as these when time stands still and all, and all you do is hold your breath and hope for the best. And she said she, she took the picture, she printed it, she put it up in her studio, and she said that the, the patrons that came into the studio just walked by it like, it, like it didn't even exist. But everything had changed for Dorothea Lange. She had no interest in her past life, and she was only interested in documenting what she saw as the, the struggles of, of people in society. So here she goes back. The following year, it's May Day. You can actually read the newspaper, 1934, and she photographs this demonstration. This is a picture of a woman who had mended her nylon stockings waiting at a demonstration. And look at how, you know, how the policeman stands so powerful in the middle of this line. These are people waiting for, not they're, they're waiting for, for jobs. 
on the street. You know, they're contract, they, 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 they're helping contractors build things like that. And this is a picture that is really beautiful. I got to read this quote to you if I can find it. Um, oh, let me read you a couple of quotes because they're fantastic. So for the May Day demonstration, she wrote, I assigned myself the task of photographing the May Day demonstrations at the Civic Center. I will go there. I will photograph this thing. I will come back and develop it. I will print it and I will mount it and I will put it on the wall all in 24 hours. I will do this to see if I can grab a hunk of lightning. And there's a great documentary on Dorothy and Lane called Grab a Hunk of Lightning. And I, I just love the fact that this is, this is the way she saw her work in her photography. In 1934, when she photographed the man beside a wheelbarrow, she said, five years earlier, I would have thought it enough to take a picture of a man, no more. But now I wanted to take a picture of a man as he stood in his world. In this case, a man with his head down and with his back against the wall with his livelihood like the wheelbarrow overturned. So here, these are these also from the May Day demonstration. So 1934, she has an exhibit. It's no longer an exhibit of wealthy people. It's a photographer of people. That's how she felt. That's what she thought she was. And here she is. This is the new Dorothea Lang, ready to take on the world. And you can see, I don't know if you can tell, but she's actually on top of the car, her, her tripod. Before we continue the Lang journey, I want to take it aside for just a second to show you what happened to Maynard Dixon. Look at how his paintings changed. He goes into the streets of San Francisco and he kind of follows the cue of Dorothea Lang. So it's just interesting. And Dorothea Lang goes out to, the, uh, to New Mexico and follows the cues of Maynard Dixon. So they really did have a huge impact on their lives. But as you can tell from the book, they just weren't good for each other and they split up. So this is Dorothy Lang in the mid 1930s. And she's assigned by the FSA to document America. And her first pictures are all of San Francisco, the streets of San Francisco, exactly what she had been photographing for the last couple of years. This is a picture I'd never seen before. I love it. It was taken on the day Franklin Roosevelt was elected president in November of 1936. And uh, this guy is, you know, obviously a Democrat. <laughs> the way he's jauntily walking through the streets, so happy with the results. But look at, look at everyone. Every, you know, sometimes there's, there's just perfect pictures. You, you know, a, you couldn't make this up on a Hollywood set. I just love it. So... In 1930, I hope I'm getting there were years right. I am 1935, she marries Paul Schuster Taylor. And Paul Schuster Taylor is an, it sounds boring, an agricultural economist, economist who, uh, who worked at the University of California at Berkeley. And he convinced Lang that the real story in America was not in the city, but was in America, was in the little towns of America. So he encourages her to go out and photograph America. And this picture, which I was using for my slideshow, I found out today was taken by Imogene Cunningham. So there's lots and lots of little connections. So in 1939, they together did a book called An American Exodus, which was a lot of writing and a lot of photographs, but interestingly, Dorothea Lange gets the top billing on this book. And here she is during her early FSA days, and these are the pictures that you probably are pretty familiar with. Family, you know, this looks right out of John Steinbeck's uh, Grapes of Wrath. Migrants going from Oklahoma, Okies, to California just to get jobs as pea pickers and as helping, you know, helping on the farms. And this picture, it's, uh, it's the opposite in a say. You know, just, just think about the class differences of looking out of this car and look at the world through her eyes. Um, in a lot of ways, I, I think that this book is really about class and about immigrants and trying to make it up in the world and, and society of people sometimes giving breaks to people, not all, you know, to, to people. Uh, 
and and I, and that became a, obviously a very important part of her life. Sometimes she took these key pictures. We all know migrant mothers coming up, but sometimes there's these little moments that are just as important as that. There, there's a bunch of, uh, these are uh, farm workers watching a baseball game. This picture I love because, oh my gosh, does it look like the 60s, what they're wearing? And the way they're, it, it looks like it's from a set uh, from, from, a, from a 1960s hippie movie. But it was a family of five on the road, you know, trying to hitchhike to the next bus, spot. This is one of uh, her most famous pictures. A woman whose uh, name, which I should know, was Nettie Featherston. And this was taken in 1938 in Texas. And one of the amazing things that Dorothy Lang did was she would interview everybody and her notes are spectacular. One person she didn't interview was the migrant mother. Um, the story of the migrant mother is she was with Ronald Hartridge, who's mentioned in the book. He was driving her, and they went by this tent with this woman in it, and they drove 20 miles past, and Dorothy Lang said, let's turn around and go back. And she went back, and Dorothy Lang said that uh, they didn't say a word to each other, and uh, she took five pictures, and this is the one that became probably one of the most famous pictures ever taken. Um, she didn't get the name of the woman. The woman later in the 1970s identified herself and, um, um, and said she felt like she was exploited by Dorothea Lang, which I both understand and don't understand. It's not as if, you know, you know but, but either way, she took five pictures and uh, she got back in the car and, and got going. Why do you guys think this picture is so important? I won't even ask you if you think it's important because I, I, I figure if you've got a ticking heart, you think it's pretty important. Is there something about it? Her eyes? Did... Yeah. I think she looks so strong and so determined. And I don't know if the kids turned away because there was a photographer there in shame. I, I don't know. It's it's hard to know. Uh, Yes, yes. So you can see all of Dorothy Lang's pictures for the Farm Security Administration, 5,000 online. If you go to the Library of Congress website and just put in Dorothy Lang, and, and early on, they'll, they'll have a little link to the five pictures, and they're really very, very interesting. This was by far the best. This was the moment where everything came together. It's spectacular. Uh, she photographed the South really beautifully. This was from a series of pictures that she called whole culture, H-O-E culture. And she photographed both whites and blacks kind of in the depths of poverty in the late 1930s. And um, I wanna make sure I get the name of this. this, this she titled this picture, Ex-Slave with a Long Memory. So what I think makes her work so extraordinary is the way she broke the bounds of what a photographer usually, there's usually a space between what a, where a photographer stands and where she stood. And she walked into that space constantly. That's what I think defines most of her pictures. And the only other photographer I've ever seen like this, anyone have a guess? Vivian Meyer. She had this ability to break through this invisible space and get intimate with people. This is after a tobacco auction. My gosh, I, I just, I mean, I, I don't think you could place people any better than, than, than they were placed. I mean, she didn't place them, she found them. Uh, we talked a little bit about the incarceration of Japanese Americans. Uh, she was given a Guggenheim grant to concentrate on kind of artistic photography, but she she got rid she she ignored it because she wanted to document 
uh, the, the, the incarceration of 120,000 Japanese Americans who lived in California and the West Coast. And this was one of her first pictures. It's, uh, it's a man who owned this grocery store and the day after Pearl Harbor put up a sign in his store to explain to people who he really was. He was taken away to a camp. Uh, these are people waiting in line to, to register. Every Japanese American was required to register who lived in these five states. And there, there's a woman waiting in line to register. And this is Dorothea Lang at, a, at another registration, I think it might've been the same day, but you get a sense of the huge Graflex camera that he, she had to carry around. So not only are you seeing a person, but you're seeing a person with this giant recording instrument, but who's able to just get intimate with people immediately. This is a picture that she took uh, near Sacramento of people waiting for the trains to take them away. And she actually had a nervous breakdown the morning that she took this picture. You can read all about it in Un American. Um, and she, she thought she was never gonna get out of bed. And she did, and she took this picture. She was just so depressed by what she was seeing. And this is one of my favorite pictures from that series. It's, it's people's clothes on a line the day before they were supposed to report. They're cleaning up their clothes. And this is actually reporting to a temporary camp in Eastern California. We had the chance as we did this book to find most of the people or many of the people in these pictures. We could never find these two boys, no matter what we did. We did find the woman waiting in line. She's the mom of somebody that, that helped us a lot, quite a bit on the book. And the last thing she did in, uh, in, at, on Japanese Americans was she went to Manzanar, this camp, uh, which I mentioned near, near Los Angeles or not near, but five hours away from Los Angeles. And she showed the conditions of the camp and it was cold and dusty and uh, a terrible place to be. Then during World War II, she documented the Braceros, Mexican workers who were asked to come to America to, um, to farm, to harvest crops. And they, it was supposed to be a temporary program and it lasted for about, I think 20 years. And these are Braceros arriving in Los Angeles. And so I'll show you three last pictures of Dorothy Ling as she got older. This is her with her son, Daniel, and she's uh, using a Hasselblad camera, probably in her early 60s, I would guess. And she, uh, one of the most important projects she ever wanted to do is she went to Ireland and she documented Ireland for Life magazine in the 1950s, and that's her in the hills of Ireland. And finally, that's what she looked like uh, a year before she died. She really battled disease over the last five years, but she was able to curate a, the, the first retrospective of her work at the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And there she is. So to me, I think what's interesting is that the book stops right at the moment before she starts her second life. And the fact that she was able to have this second life was probably reflected, was but probably based on the characters like uh, Imogen, Imogen Cunningham and Flail Kanaga, because she was exposed to all this and it took her, you know, 10 or 15 years. It was very difficult because she, because as she kind of, in, as the author in, in, insinuates in the book, Mayor Dixon wasn't making much money. And she was literally supporting them uh, through her work. Uh, and it was a very difficult time. Her boys have, have created, a, created a documentary in the early 2000s about how it was called uh, Children of Genius, about how difficult their life was because both of their parents were working very hard. I mean, and, and they were literally going from foster care to foster care homes. But they did all reconcile. They became very close, the boys and their parents and the, grand, the, the, the grandkids became very close. So... At 45 after, I'd love to take questions. Yes. The book is based on oh. an Asian American, like a real person. Yes. Right. <laughs> so have you ever seen a 
you know, they mentioned, she mentioned the name that, that, that this woman was just mentioned in an article about Dorothea Lange in the period. No, no, I looked, I looked. So it's really fascinating that she's the main character and she's the most important character. So other questions? Yes, Gary. Um, Rich, well, if you could just repeat the question. Yeah, oh, sorry. There, but, the question is, did she do color photography uh, or was that uh, after her time? No, color photography was certainly during her time, but I think that um, there's very few color pictures that she took. Uh, I think that this was the media she, you know, she had mastered black and white photography and I think she was very comfortable with it. And I think, uh, you know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like she went into the eighties and nineties, you know, it was, she died in 1965. And I think color was really just starting. So uh, she did a beautiful book about a, um, a little home that they rented in Big Sur. And this was the home where her family would come in and gather. And it's a really beautiful book. So uh, I think most photographers who established themselves in a black and white era kept as a black and white era. I would say that's generally true. I'm thinking to myself, you know, Ansel Adams, black and white all through the end. Imogene Cunningham, black and white all through the end. Uh, people didn't really, you know, make the switch easily. So, yeah, yes. Not appreciating someone following her around and confiscating pictures. Is that true? And then those pictures still around? Um, it's half true. Wait, repeat that one question. The question was: uh, Was she hounded when she took the pictures of the incarceration, and did, were the pictures not available? Um, she was absolutely watched, and you know, she almost there was there was always somebody assigned. Not always, but after a short while, there was somebody assigned to her. Um, I think that they realized that, you know, she was being paid by the government. And I'm, I think they realized that they had, they had hired the wrong person and that they better kind of try to discourage her from taking photographs. They couldn't discourage her. She kept going, although she quit less than a year after she started that project. Um, as far as these photos being unavailable, that is the legend. That is the, the, that is the basis of a, of a book about her. I, I don't think it's true. Uh, I think the pictures, you know, they weren't available immediately, but I think within five or 10 years, they were available at, at, in the Library of Congress, in the National Archives. I'm sorry, I said the Library of Congress, I mean the National Archives. And I just think that people weren't looking for them. And um, the National Archives has a lot of material. So I think that they were available, but very few people had really found them. So. Yes. Well, um, this was the period of uh, what was called white slave trading. And, and um, I think that there were lots of babies in the Chinese community created by whites and blacks together, and they were kind of abandoned and that there was a real need for it. And then she started this orphanage in a sense for that. And uh, she's pretty, pretty, um, she's, she's portrayed as a pretty incredible person. I think she really was. And she lived to an old age and she kept at it for years. So um, I hope that answers your question. Yes. Topic. Can you comment on photography in this case of Japan? Did I read somewhere that some of the photographers are, were fired by Christian papers? So the question is, talk about photojournalism today. Um, well, I worked at the Sun-Times till 1999. And in 2013, the Sun-Times decided to fire every photographer. And um, I think that the feeling at the time was that um, everybody can take a picture. And why do we need these photographers? We can give uh, iPhones to every one of our reporters and uh, everything will be okay. Um, and that didn't really last very long. They, they now have a staff of not many, but about five photographers. Um, and I think people do see the difference between a, a reporter taking an iPhone and a, and a quote, real photographer. Um, so I think, I think that they learned their lesson. Um, I think that photography is, it's funny. I worked in an era where there were print people and there were photo people. And we never, 
the, the print people thought that we photo people were trying to uh, take advantage of them by putting big pictures in the paper. In fact, I remember somebody saying to me once uh, after I suggested a picture dominate the front page, they said, do you know how much real estate you're asking for? As if they owned the real estate and we were just kind of interlopers. Um, but that's changed drastically. As I like to say to people, put a Facebook item in without a picture and see how many people see the picture. You know, I, I think, uh, I didn't go into this thinking this, but I think that we are in an incredibly visual society. Uh, if I ask you about the Vietnam War, you'll probably remember the Eddie Adams picture of the, sh of the, uh, the sheriff being shot on the streets uh, of Hanoi, uh, not Hanoi, uh, where was it? it was Yes, I got it. I'm sorry. Um, if I ask you about the civil rights movement, I'm guessing that you'll tell me that, the, that what, what comes in your mind is the, the, the hoses and Selma hosing down people, both the still pictures and the, and the um, you know, and, and, and when I look back at Life magazine, it's unbelievable how they showed the world to us. And um, I think that pictures are so important. I think that we, I'll say this, and this is controversial, but I think we learn more about the world through photographs than we were, do about words. And if I said that at my newspaper, I'd be fired. But I think that's just the case. Um, Gary. Uh, yeah, so I'd be happy to. So I've, I've written two books about Vivian Meyer. That's probably the thrill of my life. Um, and when a photographer takes pictures, for every 100 pictures, maybe one is worthwhile. But they're the only two photographers I've ever seen that you could see a roll of 12 pictures and 10 could go in a book, nine could go in an exhibit. Uh, I mean, every time, I, it, it's, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I gotta go back, okay. Um, the, the way they saw the composition that they had, um, uh, you know, I was once criticized for not cropping Vivian Meyer's pictures. And I thought, well, there's nothing to crop. There's everything she did. It was like a savant. Uh, she took a picture of somebody walking by and there was, and there's no need to crop the left-hand side or the right-hand side or the top or bottom. And the same thing with Dorothea Lange. When you see her pictures, there's very little uh, that, that you would change. Um, you know, Viv Vivian Meyer really focused on personal life and what it was like to live in this era. Um, um, Ira Glass once said, it was really interesting. He did a segment on, you guys know Ira Glass. He did a segment on Vivian Meyer. And he said, when I see pictures of the 60s, I'm seeing pictures of Muhammad Ali and I'm seeing pictures of rocket ships blasting off. But then when I see Vivian Meyer's pictures, I'm seeing pictures of my life, you know, that, that really touches him. And that's what made her so special. Um, and I think Dorothea Lange had this amazing ability that within seconds could connect with people and take a picture and then walk away. And I've just, I've just never seen it with anybody else. Um, and they are the, you know, of all the photographers I've, I've had a chance not to work with, but to work with their material, they are uh, in, a, in, a, in a, not in a class by themselves, but they, they, they're in a different realm than everybody else. So I see them very similar, but I don't see Vivian Meyer. I talked about her book about Big Sur. It's okay, but I don't see her being the personal life photographer. I see her as the big news story. I'm going to photograph migrants. I'm going to photograph the South. Uh, I'm going to follow, photograph people who are out of work in San Francisco, whereas I see Vivian Meyer as I'm going to photograph my neighborhood in, in Highland Park or, you know, stuff like that. So they had different themes and ideas, but the work is, that's just beautiful work. Uh, Rich, we have one question. Someone would like to know, do you know what happened to Kansi? I do. Um, I just have to remember. Um, she worked for a San Francisco paper for a couple of years. She had real problems the rest of her life. And I think she was ended up in a sanitarium for much of her life. So she was kind of uh, not helped by her parents or by Mayor Dixon's wife, obviously. And she just had a rough life. So... I also just want to mention for people that are here in the room, 
that we have a couple books on the table, um, including on American, which we talked about throughout this program. So if you want to take a look at some of the books that Rich, um, which is books, you can take a look at those um, or check them out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the River of Love book is really an important book to me because um, I'll explain it to you real briefly. So in the 1930s, the government wanted to hire people for jobs. So they decided to interview formerly enslaved men and women. And all of them were at least 75 years old by 1938. And they interviewed, believe it or not, 3,000 formerly enslaved men and women. And uh, it's called the Slave Narratives. And it's all available online. You can go to every slave narrative. But they photographed also about three or 400 of these people. And the photographs were amateurish. They were just done by the interviewer at the end. They kind of take a picture of you. And what we did is we found the essence of what they were saying, and we put it next to the picture of who they were. And so, so my life, if you want to sum it up in one sentence, is a combination of words and pictures, because the words are great, the pictures are great, and together they're like amazing. So that's one of the things that, as much as I love Vivian, uh, Dorothea Lange's photographs, if you read what she wrote about every person, uh, and there is a book of her, her what they call captions, it's pretty spectacular. So, and there's another question. So, I'd like to know if you know about her connection with the Korean community and her taking pictures of um, individuals from that community. Um, I don't. Oh, okay. I don't. I know there's some pictures of Korean Americans, but I I don't know about the connection. I'm not I'm not su surprised because not only oftentimes not, she did create these long term connections with people that she photographed. And, uh, and, and there's letters of her over life of people that she, she photographed. So it doesn't surprise me. Other questions? Oh man, I've never finished tonight, 58 minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm interested, uh, I know this is gonna be hard uh, for the TV, but what, do you, what are your guys' thoughts seeing, seeing this work and reading the book? We don't have a microphone, so I have to repeat whatever you say. great great she said that i was great <laughs> and that was pretty much it other i i, I like being an interpreter yes Enjoyed seeing the pictures as I was reading the book. Yeah, the question, yeah, you said that there, she would have enjoyed seeing some of the pictures rather than reading the book. Um, yeah, I thought about that as I was putting this together, even like a middle section. But, you know, there's also something to be said about uh, imagination. And once you see a person's picture, you know, uh, it's, it's strangely, it's the reason I've never put my picture in the back of a book because I want people to just imagine me as this really handsome. Guy, and if I have the picture, it's like you know, oh my gosh. So, but no, I, I think, but it would be different because you're you're in a um, you're in a world that she's created artistically, and and when you see the like the King of Bohemia is like perfect, but if you see some other people, it might just not, you know, it's better that you may maybe imagine it. I, I I kind of thought it was okay because it was you know, it's historical fiction too, and it wasn't nonfiction. I think if it was nonfiction, I think you'd almost have to have the pictures. So, yes. I read the book about the documentary of the portrayal, and I kind of felt like she took a lot of liberties and, and left the thumbs out a little. But now I'm listening to you, and it's a very short period of time. So, when you read the book, knowing more about Dorothy Lang than I do, did you feel like it was true to her life timeline, or it took no, I, I I thought it was you know I, what I thought was unusual. So the question is, the question was, um, I did a good job on the lecture. No, um, I think it was. I I I love the fact that it focused on these very few years. The most interesting thing to me was that her life really started on the moment that the book ended, and that I thought was pretty amazing that 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 a writer would do that. Um, and I thought that everything she wrote seemed real to me. The one thing that seems strange to me is that she talks about the FBI 
doing the Palmer raids in 1919 when everyone was raided and the government got, and 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 I did kind of look back at it and the FBI was involved, but it wasn't like an FBI led raid. It was more of a government justice. It was a Justice Department raid, but not FBI. But that was the only thing that really were the things that stood out to anyone else that just didn't seem right. I thought it was I thought it was pretty pretty interesting. Right, 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 right. And and you know, I, I I thought to myself maybe they were people weren't bohemian enough, but when you think about the women who had photography careers and who were dealing with men who were not helping them and they kept it didn't matter, they were just gonna do their art. I thought it was pretty amazing. So uh anyone else? Thank you all very much for coming. Rich, thank you so much.